body back. <laughs> We're really early for church. Um, welcome to worship. It's good to have everyone together and good to have those who are joining us on the live stream with us as well. A um, couple of, of quick announcements. This is the last Sunday before your order forms for Easter flowers, so if you were intending to do that, uh, grab one of the, the order forms and um, get those turned in. And if you still aren't sure today, um, you can call Lisa because she won't place the order till, till tomorrow. Um, Midweek Lent, Lenten worship continues, so we've had several great suppers and evening worship with Holden Evening Prayer together on our theme, Amazing Grace. And so I invite you to um, return again this, this next Wednesday, 6.15 for soup and 7 p.m. for worship. Uh, we're collecting Easter candy. You'll notice a basket um, as you walk in there by the Get Connected wall. And we'll be collecting Easter candy for um, our Easter egg hunt. So if you're able to drop that off, that is um, much appreciated. And... There's information on donations for personal care kits. We do that every year for Lutheran World Relief in the spring. So check those items and see um, what you might be able to donate towards those kits. And uh, I think then that is, oh, and tonight um, at five o'clock, the uh, high school youth are meeting. So. If you have one of those in your life, um, or if there are those that are listening online, please remind them that 5 o'clock we'll be meeting here at the church to discuss the plans for the egg hunt, as well as just hanging out and having some fellowship. I invite you then to please stand as you are able, and we will begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. <coughs> Holy God, we confess to you our faults and failings. So often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We do for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We cause hurt to those you call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and forgive us as we seek to follow in your way of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen.
join together in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. Bring the men and women with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson is from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. David is chosen and anointed. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of me, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Saul did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse said, made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mighty upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Awake from sleep, live as children of light. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord.
You may be seated. Once again, we find ourselves with a long gospel story. And so we will be reading it from um, multiple voices once again. And uh, thank you to those who volunteered um, to be readers today. So the gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. Then the man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. The man born blind kept saying, I am the man. Then how were your eyes opened? The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Where is he? I do not know. The neighbors brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask the man how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And the Pharisees were divided. What do you say about it? Was your eyes open? He is a prophet. The Jews, authority, Jewish authorities, did not believe the man had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son? We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, for the Jewish authorities had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, the Pharisees called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then the Pharisees reviled him. You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world has begun has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. You were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to keep God? And the Pharisees drove him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had driven the man out, and he went to find the man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. Lord, 
I believe. And the man who could now see worshipped Jesus. I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this. Surely we are not blind, are we? If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. So what did you hear today? Did you hear it a little differently as we told the story through different voices? We've heard this story before. Jesus heals the man born blind. Did you notice anything new? Was there anything that surprised you? If we had time to sit and chew on this a bit, a bit what questions would you ask? What do you wonder about? Maybe you identify with the man born blind, or you relate to the neighbors and his parents, or maybe the questions the Pharisees asked aren't too different from your own. If I were to ask my own questions that I just ask you, I would have a lot of things on my list. You see, one of the things I've noticed is how Jesus just sort of slips in and out of the scene. He tells the man to go wash, but then he's not back until the very end when he seeks the man out once he's been kicked out of the synagogue. And that makes me realize that until Jesus comes to him later, the man never got to see Jesus. He never saw him. He never saw the one who restored his sight, but about him he testified again and again. And he never wavered in his witness. The other thing I can't help but notice is there's, well, there's a lot of comedy in the way this whole story plays out. There's back and forth of questioning, and then we keep adding more witnesses that don't seem to be able to come to any conclusion. But the main eyewitness, eyewitness, who never saw Jesus, he's got the whole story straight from the beginning to the end. The man born blind's response show his frustration in a humorous way that can help us, if we listen, to understand that everyone else in the story is missing the point. With all these interesting bits and pieces of the story, it would be easy to get caught up. It's easy to get lost in all the different details sort of like a Google search that leads you miles away from that first thing that you typed into the search bar. You know, when you look up a thing that you want to know and then start clicking on all the endless blue links. You'll end up reading more about a lot of things related to your search. And some might be helpful and some not. But ultimately, you could lose touch with the thing that you were originally seeking to find. Well, in a way, our story illustrates that. In their efforts to understand what had just happened among them to the man that they have always been known as having been born blind, the community around him starts following the trail of information. And though the man's story stays the same, they keep chasing additional details, clicking on all those links, and they lose sight of what's really taken place among them. So in the midst of all the possible details, what I keep coming back to is that last monologue of the man who now has his sight. That last speech that he makes to the Pharisees right before they kick him to the curb. The man says, here is the astonishing thing. You do not know where this Jesus come from, comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Astonishing. Never since the world began has it been heard. Those are some big statements. The man who's been given sight sees the whole thing quite clearly indeed. And the details don't matter. Everything in his life has changed. And yet he knows that this is much bigger than only him. He can see that the rules have changed. Nothing is the same. God in this Jesus who came to him has just accomplished a big thing. An astonishing thing. Something that no one's ever done before. The world, as all the different players in this scene have known it, well, it's no longer what they knew it to be. See, there are just certain things that a person can take for granted. Like, people who were born blind usually stay blind. But now, that's up for grabs. And if that's up for grabs, <laughs> well, then what else is? I don't like to pick on the Pharisees too much. You know, they were coming from a particular point of view, and, and they were being faithful to it. They loved and they followed the law of God. And they helped their neighbors navigate their lives in relation to that holy law. Their Jewish identity was grounded in certain behaviors and in that way of living. It was how they found meaning in their relationship with God with the world they lived in, with the community in which they were a part. I think the Pharisees truly believed God could heal, but they didn't think God would break God's own law, doing the work of healing on the Sabbath. For them, immediately, it just all got called into question. Something doesn't seem quite right. I mean, how could this be an act of God? Where is this Jesus from? What are his credentials? How did he do this? And so the how of the recovery of the man's sight becomes way more important than the astonishing fact that it happened at all. The man who received his sight never changes his story. He says, this is what I know. Listen to me. I was blind, and now I see. This is astonishing. This must be from God. When has this ever happened before? Now, I don't want to boil this down to just saying that we all need to be more like the man born blind who received his sight from Jesus. It isn't that we need to be more like him. I think the point is we are him. It's right there in how the man received his sight and how we receive the gift of baptism, the gift of faith. It's the beginning of an astonishing thing that God does. The man sitting there by the side of the road begging as he has done every day to survive. And Jesus walks by. And the man doesn't ask Jesus to heal him, but Jesus sees him. Jesus puts mud on his eyes and then tells him to go wash. And the man, trusting and hoping in what Jesus said, goes and washes up and receives his sight. Now the story doesn't say, but we could suppose, that there was someone who helped lead that man to the pool where he washed. Just as you and I at some point were taken by someone carried up to the baptismal font. Washed and clean, given a new way to look at the world and seeing the astonishing things that God is doing. And if we think of the wonder and the awe that children have, the way they look out and see the world, it was like the man seeing for the first time. The world is one big, wide open space. And God is busy doing incredible things. But I think then, 
even as this gracious thing happens to us, we end up going back to the way it used to be. That wide open space narrows down again, and we get stuck in our one spot there on the side of the road. The world shrinks again. It just becomes the people and the places we know best. We're back in our comfort zone. We're in a place that we know so well that we can get around in the dark, following the same path over and over and not getting tripped up. We are the blind man. But we're also the Pharisees, too. We're here trying to be faithful, seeing the details, interpreting the world through this, through this lens of faith. But events that happen to others or to us, those are never really isolated incidents that we can look at and examine all on their own. Because each one of us, each person, is part of the bigger community, part of the whole world. Martin Luther said that we're all beggars as we come to the altar. We all hold our hands out in need of God's grace, a free gift. And just like that man born blind was a beggar, and he received a free gift from Jesus. It's a gift we can't ask for because, well, it isn't anything that our small imagination could put to words. It's so big, it's so wide open, this thing that God does for us. When has it ever been done that a sinner is made a saint? Well, by the grace and love of God for the whole world, God comes to us in Jesus and makes us new and then connects us forever to, forever to something that is bigger than ourselves. We are now and will always be in relationship with an astonishing God. And that is the story that we get to tell over and over again. I couldn't see it before, but Jesus showed me all the things that God can do. And the one thing that we were focused on is just one thing in God's great big landscape. God is not just being God for us, but we realize that God is God for the sake of the whole world. God's connected to it all, not just you to you or me, but God is active, moving in relationship with the whole world, all people, all creation. Everything is connected. When the man received his sight, everything had changed, and not just for him, but for the whole world. The man born blind sees that this sight is not just his. God just got a whole lot bigger, a whole lot more astonishing. God is out of the box, and there's no way to contain God within the same old limits, those narrow views again. It's no longer about how your or my God relates to the world, but how the God of the whole world relates to you and to me and how we relate to one another. And through it all, Jesus sticks with us. He doesn't just give us this mind-blowing vision of things and then move on, but he comes back to us again and again. Just like Jesus sought out the man who received his sight after hearing that he was booted from the synagogue and turned into an outcast in the community. Jesus comes and says, I am he. I am the one you can believe in. You see me, I am here with you. The brokenness of the world and our own brokenness will threaten to limit our viewpoint. But Jesus restores us, restores us so that we can look through a lens of faith over and over again in a broader, bigger picture than we ever imagined. He does it for us, for each one of us, for our own sake, yes, of course. But he also does that for the sake of the whole world. So we can continue to tell that astonishing story of a God who loves the world 
and each part of us in that world. A God who loves the world so much as to die for it. An astonishing story. A story where a water is, a, where a well is full of living water and that it never runs dry for the thirsty. An astonishing story of beggars who receive the gift of grace. And soon, very soon, an astonishing story of how even the dead will rise again. Amen.
join together in the offering prayer. God is with you. Receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faith and service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to grace. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
body, God. At your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.